This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And this week he's taking a look at the post-apocalyptic arsenal of Joel and Ellie in The Last of Us Part 1. Right, there is some significant recoil going on here, which would no doubt be improved if he would put the thing in his shoulder. Make sure to subscribe and let us know what other games or guns you'd like to see Jonathan break down in the comments section down below. Right, let's take a look at more weapons from The Last of Us Part well, 1. That's what she believes. <laughs> well, how were you bitten? I mean, you must have been somewhere you shouldn't to find an infected in a zone. Yeah, I, I'd sneak out. Right, first handgun up. It's very clearly a Browning High Power, GP35, whatever you'd like to call it. It has a few names. However, there's some different, there are some differences. So it's shorter. It's more like a compact variant, which there isn't of the true Browning High Power. You'll find them for the double action spin-off. So it's too short, effectively. And there's, to me, the grip shape is a little bit more reminiscent of the current Browning high power that is not actually Browning high power. Think of it as a 1911 in 9mm with more rounds, because it sort of is, but not really. Very popular in all aspects. This example that I've picked is just a really nice, beautifully finished, circa 1951 example of the Browning high power. Okay, gameplay-wise, lot of recoil, a lot of recoil. Joel's hands, or maybe it's his Jack Bauer style grip there, but um, his recoil control is not great. His grip is good. I, I would expect that sort of implied recoil more so from a like a Magnum level revolver or something. Uh, it's fine. It's a minor thing. The graphics have definitely been bumped up from from what I remember. Quite a lot of detail there in this this view. We can see the rifling grooves in the barrel. They are a bit too pronounced, but they are beautifully rendered. <laughs> and, and I can see from this angle another bit of liberty, creative liberty taken with the design. And it's the one place where our example here has got a bit of worn finish, is the front uh, edge of the trigger guard, front corner, where well, it shouldn't have a corner, it should be rounded, almost like an extended 1911 trigger guard, which is kind of what it is. More, more of a later era. So what, what we could say this is, is a Browning High Power clone made by some fictional um, third-party manufacturer. So we, we get a nice convenient view of the back of Joel's head as he uh, carries out some some sleight of hand there and ma some magically makes his magazine longer. So he's got a he's got an extended base plate, fair enough. But then when the magazine is in the gun and extended, the actual body of the magazine has magically extended. Adding a base plate does not stretch the metal tube of the magazine. All right, another mystery gun here. This doesn't seem to be based on anything real. Almost looks homemade or made in a workshop or something of that nature. The frame looks like it's made out of a U-shaped piece of metal, or at least it's been milled out to create a hinge point, so it's break open. There are very few modern break open revolvers because they're not strong enough. It's just, it's not really worth making break open revolvers because a swing out cylinder is, is more efficient anyway, and it makes the frame weaker if you're trying to chamber magnum cartridges. So they're pretty rare. Very, very little in the way of top break revolvers. And this is not that, this is something else. We've gone from a single chamber, well, yeah, chamber insert instead of a cylinder to uh, the upgrade here, which is a double chambered cylinder, sort of, but there doesn't seem to be the clearance for it to actually revolve. It's too tall uh, and the angles don't make sense. That could not spin in the frame. And I, I'm, I haven't slowed it down. I can't see whether it's actually revolving in the frame anyway, but needless to say, it couldn't work if it didn't. So I assume it is. So it must be clipping through itself to achieve that. There are uh, conversions to single shot for revolvers that you put a block chamber into that gap instead. If, you, if all you're trying to do is achieve single shot accuracy, they're quite rare, but they do exist. This thing upgraded is, is something else. It's like a two shot revolver that doesn't make much sense. I'm not sure what's going on with the ejector rod and spring being exposed there as well. That's also a bit strange. Yeah, another oddball weapon.
bolt action rifle, big feature of the of these games, of course, and also in the TV series. Pretty clearly based on a Remington 700, albeit with the usual changes in detail. We have a couple of Remington 700s in the collection, scoped. Neither of them were in quite configuration that I saw, so I've grabbed this one instead, which is in completely the different a uh, different <laughs> configuration but is quite unusual. Um, this is the Remington 700 e-tronics, and it has an electronic trigger. There's an LED in the stock here to show you that you have battery power, and there's an on-off switch that's operated by a key in the semi-pistol grip there. The key is attached to the label here. And when that's on, you have, it's a, it's a micro switch in the trigger. Don't know if that will come through on the microphone, probably not. I would say it's experimental. It's not. It was it was brought to market in the early 2000s. Didn't do very well, but not for want of trying. And yeah, we'll see. We'll see whether it comes back. It's completely irrelevant to, to the game because we that is a very conventional Remington 700 with a mechanical trigger, clearly. Let's do this. I haven't run and, and grabbed one for you. I think you know the Remington 870 shotgun by now. Iconic pump action shotgun design. That's obviously what, what this is. The uh, trigger guard is too thick and chunky, both for the design of the 870 and really for what it needs to be. Uh, all it has to do is stop your finger from touching the trigger too easily or from anything else um, touching it. That's really, really chunky. But the overall design, um, yeah, pretty clearly 870. Like real, real detail stuff, but the extractor that's on the on the side of the bolt at the front there it's got a bit of unnecessary detail and, and the way it's modeled on there it makes me think that um it's not understood how it, how it works or what its job is which is completely understandable and fair enough uh, effects wise handling wise it feels big and powerful and punchy uh looks good it looks like a handful actually to to try to with it with the slow reload and the relatively limited capacity to make sure you take out those not zombies before uh, they get too close to you and when you do hit them or a person it's it's devastating too devastating it's fair to say i like the the visual interest of that level of interaction shall we say as much as the next third person shooter player but um blowing entire heads off such that there's nothing there at all uh, and an arm at the same time in one case shotguns are very effective but they're not that effective Okay, we've got an AR-15 type rifle or something very close to it. The proportions are all a little bit off, I think. Only a bit. So the height of the lower receiver is massive compared to what it what it ought to be. The way it kind of uh, the up, the upper looks looks fine to me. Don't know, it's it's close enough. It's absolutely close enough um for an AR the big i don't know it feels to me like they might have um sort of up the original model i don't know how close this is can't remember sorry i did review it but can't remember how close it is to the original game model but it's not not that faithful to an actual ar absolutely close enough uh, the sling swivel being attached to the side of the lower receiver it's not good placement and it's not something you'll see on a real gun and it would interfere with how it works as well in terms of attaching it to the side. Overall impression, yeah, it's basically an M4, something close to it, without getting into super nerdy detail about it. What it isn't, I don't think, is one of these video game clutches where they take two real rifles in this case and smush them, smoosh them together such that they don't look like one or the other. They haven't done that. They've gone for their take on an AR in this universe. Oh dear, Joel has a severe case of the Marcus Phoenixes here in that, uh, and he's not, not just that he's hiding behind chest high walls, he's not shouldering his rifle. Now, at least in Gears of War, they had the excuse that they mostly didn't have buttstocks. Here, he does, but he's not shouldering the rifle. He's not using the sights. Now, okay, depending on your experience level, you might look over the gun and aim more instinctively, but there's still no reason to not pull that stock into your shoulder for stability because that's going to improve your shooting regardless of what you do with the sides so it's a an odd choice to have him just hold the gun out in front of him like he's never used a rifle before
Right, there is some significant recoil going on here, um, which would no doubt be improved if he would put the thing in his shoulder. Um, there's so little recoil, relatively speaking, on a 5.56 rifle that even if you were to hold it away from your shoulder like that, I don't think you'd experience that much recoil. Of course, a game likes to not compensate for the recoil as you instinctively would as a shooter. If you shot anything at all, you, you would you would anticipate it coming up after the first couple of rounds at least and, and try to do something to bring it back down. Games often don't do that, so the recoil is going to look excessive on most things. But it, this, proportionately speaking, compared to the other weapons in the game, uh, I think there's too much going on. But yeah, maybe that's because of how he's holding the thing. Right, flamethrower. Very improvised. Lots of pipe work, commercially available gas tank screwed onto the bottom there. And it looks like, I don't know, butane, lighter fluid type igniter at the rear with a pipe conveying that to the front. So far, so good. Uh, and a, a bicycle brake lever to, or maybe a motorbike brake or clutch lever, not sure, that releases the stream of fuel out the front, which is really nicely modeled in terms of being um, unlit as it, as it emerges, if you see what I mean, and then igniting on the way out. So you get that short jet of fuel and then the flame effect. Looks really good. Can't quite figure out how it's supposed to work because that igniter seems to terminate in a, a rag clamped over the end, which is one way to do a flamethrower. You set light to that oily rag at the end and that's your ignition source. And then you spray your high high pressure fuel over the top of it and it, and it lights. So, but there's a sort of disconnect between the igniter along the bottom and the actual fuel jetting out of the into that cage on the top if, if someone else can figure this out please do comment but in the in the brief clip that i've just seen i couldn't wrap my head around it looks like it should work i'm not convinced that it does mechanically speaking uh the the effect of the the flame it, it looks looks good i think the the fact that you can semi light someone on fire and they're struggling to put the cells out it's pretty grim but I haven't seen that done before. People are, usually, are either on fire and dying in games or they're absolutely fine. So the idea that you can wound someone with with flame is kind of impressive and different. In reality, of course, if your whole right arm is that scorched, you're probably gonna rethink your life choices and not come after the, the shooter. So the, the, the fact that they can shrug off these grievous injuries and still keep fighting until they do get killed is less realistic, obviously. Okay, um, Ellie here with her sidearm, which I think is modeled on the Volta P5, a sort of successor to the P38. Um, this is the P5 Compact, which I think is closer to the version on screen. It's quite, it's still quite a chunky pistol, despite being, in this case, compact. It's not like a, not quite as chunky in the hand as a Beretta 92, maybe not even a Glock, because it is single stack. But um, for someone who's a bit younger, small framed, it's it's quite a handful still. Uh, but they represent that, I think. The way the, the character's hand is, is sort of, only just wrapped around the grip seems to be what they're going for. It wasn't a perfect fit in her hand in the view that I had initially. Like the, the fingers were sort of clipping through the gun slightly. An unusual choice. You don't really see this in, in much otherwise. Right, this is an Accuracy International Arctic Warfare Magnum, or at least something very close to it. This is an A3, or what's left of one. So if, I, if I'm looking at this correctly, the version of the in the game is lacking the thumbhole stock. You can see where this should 
should connect to a to a <laughs> what's a, a missing piece of stock here and all you have is the thumb hole to put your hand through so it's a folding folding butt stock press the catch and it folds for transport uh, and locks into itself as well along the left side but it, this one's missing big chunks as you can see so this ironically makes it look more like the game gun a bit missing its scope as well that's not unusual when we receive things from um trials and this is from a trial of some sort uh, we've yet to find out what hopefully we will and so it's missing various bits magazine is missing but you can see it's a it is in fact the magnum variant it's uh uh, 338 Lapua Magnum. Uh, we see a difference here with the bolt handle. So the bolt handle on the game gun is tiny, really tiny and straight, whereas the AI is cranked for easy access and it has a much larger uh, knob, obvious grasping purposes. But we can see the big, the fairly iconic squared off AI cocking piece here. Uh, the fluted barrel is visible, as is that somewhat distinctive muzzle device as well, which is a, a chambered brake um, with a, a thread for suppressor, uh, and they are used with suppressors. Now, this is missing a bipod as well, but in the game, this thing is fitted to a sniping a monopod fixed bolted to the floor monopod uh, makes it very very stable less flexible because you have to detach it from the from the mount to to use it more flexibly so i, I guess joel has come across this in situ and is turning it against the occupants always nice to see an ai in a game you know they are one of the few british firearms or british military firearms makers so um good to see them represented thanks everyone for watching those were the guns of the last of us part one retrospectively titled part one i'm looking forward to getting hold of that game myself i have to say i hope you enjoyed it as always there are numerous links in the description relating to what we do here at the royal armories we'd appreciate it if you checked that out um i've got an article out at the moment in our max journal which is also in the description as well if you'd like to check out the link over there uh, it does cost money, I, but I hope you think it's worth it. We will see you again next time on this very series.